thinking and I did a little poll. Some of the worst things that you can run into is an out of order sign. You ever seen those out of order signs when you're, you're counting on something or you're really needing something and you go for it and, and all of a sudden there's just a sign that's just saying this is not in use, this is not gonna work out. So I took a very unscientific poll to find out what are the four worst out of order signs you can ever run into and this is what people told me. The fourth worst sign you can run into is an out of order sign on the vending machine at your job when you left your lunch home that day. The third worst, and I think this might be my, my favorite one, the third worst out of order sign you will find is on the last parachute after everyone else has jumped out. That's why you shouldn't go jumping out no plane. The second worst out of order sign you'll find is on that gas pump when your car is on E and you drove an extra 10 miles to go to that secret gas station that you think only you know about that has cheaper gas. And my favorite one, number one, please don't kill me for this, the worst out of order sign is on the bathroom door at Taco Bell. <laughs> you never want to see an out of order sign on the bathroom door at Taco Bell. If you love your life, you probably should just never eat at Taco Bell at all. <laughs> but anyway, as we're talking about broke, as we're talking about broken and, and applying that to our financial lives or the area of our finances, I don't think it takes a genius to figure out that the way things are going right now is just not working. Would, would you agree with me on that? The economy is all up different places, the, the housing market is all over, the, the unemployment rate just dropped its lowest in three years and it's still over 8%. Things in the world in terms of our finances are just broken. The way that we're approaching finances in the world is just broken. But here's the major problem. The major problem is that it's not just broken in the world, but it's broken also in the kingdom of God. You don't have to flip too far on Christian channels to see someone selling you some holy oil and saying, if you would just send, you know, Psalms 555 offering to me, God's going to bless you above and beyond. And all God wants you to do is drive a Bentley and have a plane and you just have to send this one time gift. And, and either that or the other side is God wants you to be broke as a joke. Just give everything that you have to the poor. And we're thinking about heaven and it's not about us at all. The church has come so far away from the standards and the principles of God to the point that the world doesn't even want to hear what the church has to say. And most people, when they come to the church, they're like, oh, my goodness, what are they going to try to get me for now? Do you know that, that Barnard took a poll and he says to, to find out what's the main reasons why people, the unchurched, don't go to church? And you know what those reasons were? Number one was that church folk are mean. <laughs> people said, I don't want to go to church because church folk are just un friendly. We don't have anybody at, like that at Destiny Harvest, right? <laughs> uh -huh. Y'all didn't sound too convinced. <laughs> but the first reason is that I don't want to go to church because church folk are mean. But you know the second reason why? The second reason why is because people say, I don't want to go to church because the church is just going to try to get my money. How horrible is it that now the house of God is seen as a place that is to manipulate, that is looking to, to, to get over on people and to actually take from people when Christ said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve others. I'm telling you, we've moved far away from the plan and the purpose that God has for us in this area. Our paradigm on finances is broken. Now, you may be sitting here and saying, hold on, Pastor Steve, I'm in college, I'm broke as a joke, I don't have a job, and I have no desire to listen to a four-week series on how to spend money that I do not have. But here's the thing, I thought about you too. If you read the Gospels, Jesus spent more time talking about finances than he spent talking about heaven or hell. Can you believe that? He spent more time talking about finances than he spent talking about heaven or hell. And, the, and I was like, God, why is that? Why were you focusing more on finances than you were focusing on heaven and hell? Not because finances are more important, not because God is all about money, but because how we manage our finances says a lot about what's going on in our lives. And God says it's actually not about the money, but I'm trying to teach you a lesson. I'm trying to teach you a principle. I'm trying to show you what is most valuable 
valuable to me, which is not the finances you have, but what you do with the resources that God has given you. Amen? So if you would just bear with me, we're going to throw out four things that God is looking to show us, four things that God wants to transform in our lives and teach us about our finances. If you have your bulletin, pull out the little sermon insert and fill in the first blank. The first blank is this. It's a heart thing. It's a heart thing. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2 says this. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and attest you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Do you know what God's number one concern is? God's number one focus is who has your heart. God is concerned about what is the number one desire in your life. When God brought the children of, e of Israel out of Egypt, he says, I need a test. I need to make sure what their desire is, what their passion is, what they're running after with their life. Because God says, if I'm not the number one desire of their life, they will end up wasting their life and destroying the opportunity that he has given us. You know, different people have different things that they say, when I accomplish this or when I take hold of that, that's when I'm going to feel complete or that's when I'm going to be satisfied. Some people are like, when I get that doctor before my name, then I'm knowing this, I'm complete, I'm happy. Or, or it may be, hey, when I get that house or when I get this car or when I finally get married or whatever it is, you have that one thing that you say, this is what I'm looking for, for my completeness. And God says, as long as your mindset is like that, I'm going to always put you in a situation where you have nowhere else to turn until you realize that God is the only thing worth pursuing. God is the only thing worth running after. Somebody say amen. amen. Do you know a lot of times, and, and this is not going to be an apologizing message, but sometimes as I listen to, 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 to messages and I think about how the church is, is, is leading people, I think sometimes without even knowing it, we can send the message that church is all about what you can get, how God can bless your life. Just surrender to God and he's going to bless you. He's going to give you finances. He's going to fix your house. He's going to fix your marriage. He's going to fix your kids. He's, he's going to fix your teeth. I mean, just, just, just pursue God and he's going to fix everything in your life. And that's true, but that's not why we pursue God. We pursue God because he is the almighty God, because he is the creator of the universe, because there is none like him. We pursue God because while we were in our wretched state, while we were separated from him, God says, I loved you so much that I would lay down my life, that I would give you all that I had. And what happens is God says, I want to see where your heart is. Is your heart caught up in things, or is your heart caught up in God? You know, a lot of times we think, you know, well, God wants me to have everything, or God doesn't want me to have anything. Can I, can I be honest with you? God really doesn't really care what you have. What he cares is what has you. God's not concerned about you having things. He's concerned about things having you. When you find your identity in material things, God says, no, you're setting yourself up up for a spiritual bankruptcy. Somebody say amen. amen. Let me just hit this one verse. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. God will bring you to a place where you have nowhere else to turn so that you can realize, God, you're all I've ever needed. I heard a missionary says, God will become all you want when God is all you need. <laughs> oh, no, no, God will become all you want when God is all that you have. And when God is all that you have, you'll realize that God is all that you need. In other words, God will make sure that at some point you come to a place where you have nowhere to turn, where you can't pick up your phone, you can't swipe your way out of it, you can't call your way out of it, you can't manipulate your way out of it, where it's just a fact where you have to look up in God to God and say, God, I surrender. 
God, I need you. God, you are the center. You are the only thing that I have to turn to. And can I just say this as a pastor instead of your friend? When God brings you to that place, stay there. No matter what he brings in your life, stay in that place of desperation of, God, I have nothing. No matter how much you have, stay in the place that, God, you're the only one that I'm banking on. Even though this might look like it can support me, God, you're the only one that I am looking to. And I'm telling you, as long as we stay in that place, God will be able to trust us with influence. He'll be able to trust us with wealth. He'll be able to trust us with status because he'll know that that means nothing to us. You know, it's so funny just how some people, they, they'll get, you know, just one title in front of their name. It could just be lead whatever. I, I was at a... a, a establishment that everybody knows that I'm, I'm not going to tell you what it is just so just in case you work there you won't stone me after church but uh at this place they call all their managers coach and uh if you work there you know where i'm talking about now and and, and they say some page coach so and so and page coach so and so and and page coach so and so and and i'm standing there waiting to speak to this manager and i look i was like you guys call your managers coach they're like, yeah, I don't know what all that is about. They just wanted to come up with something to make it feel like a team. So now we're just calling everybody coach. But there's just something about sometimes when people get a title, all of a sudden they begin to find their identity in that title or they begin to find their identity in that GPA score and how many zeros are in your bank account. And God is saying, no, you need to find your identity in Christ. You need to find your satisfaction in Christ. You need to become complete in Christ, and then you become a candidate for God to be able to add things in to your life.